These are some electrical measurements from these films. Uh, this is a plot of the resistant, uh, resistivity, ohms, centimeters here, versus the amount of nitrogen flow in the gas during the deposition. So a film with no nitrogen added, you see, has 5,000 ohm centimeter resistivity. We add some nitrogen, the resistivity decreases by three orders of magnitude. Add a little more nitrogen, decreases by one order of magnitude, and then not much change at all. So we tend to work with films between 10 and 30 SCCM of nitrogen. This has a good conductivity for all of the measurements that we're interested in. If you look at the temperature dependence of the resistivity, you can see that here. Not very big change of resistivity of temp with temperature. So you can see from room temperature to 500, we're only changing the resistivity from 0.25 to 0.05, so virtually no change with temperature, so not really an activated conduction mechanism or metallic-like conduction through this material. If you do what are called Hall effect measurements to look at how many carriers you have and the mobility of these carriers, it helps us understand about the electrical properties. In this measurement, we'll take the, an insulating silicon substrate put on a SiO2 insulating layer of silicon dioxide, the conducting film, and a two metal contacts. And we measure the electrical properties with the Hall effect system. Here showing again the resistivity as a function of the temperature again. So the blue dots are the very first measurement. And you can see there's a small change, not very much, 04 to 01 ohm centimeters with temperature. And then we do a second one, that's the red dots. So this decrease right here is, is uh, decreasing the contact resistance with the annealing. So very often you see this from the first measurement to the second. But here are the data, again, resistivity, 10 to the minus 2 ohm centimeters, virtually no temperature dependence across that range. If you look at the Hall effect data, this is a plot of the carrier concentration, and this is a plot of the mobility of those carriers as a function of the temperature. And remember the electrical resistivity is a product of the mobility and the charge carrier concentration. So a little bit noisy in these data, but generally speaking, the red dots, around 10 to the 20th per cubic centimeter in terms of our carrier concentration. And if we look over here at the mobility, it's about five to 10. So material has a lot of grain boundaries, a lot of nodules, so there's a lot of scattering. So the mobility is low but carrier concentration is high, so we have a conductivity that is 10 to the minus two or so forth. So very, very good electrical properties for what we would need to do electrochemically. Chemically, we can use X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy here to tell us something about the chemical composition in the near surface region of the film. So if we just look down at this particular view graph, this is plotting the atomic ratio of oxygen to carbon, that's these dots, and nitrogen to carbon, that's the dots here. So this is a function of the nitrogen flow. So you can see as we add nitrogen to the growth, you get a progressive increase in the amount of nitrogen that's present in the film. So this nitrogen to carbon atomic ratio increases here. The oxygen to carbon atomic ratio is basically constant. Some of this comes from the deposition, but most of it comes from just exposure to the air because the film set out in the air many, many long time before we made this measurement. So oxygen to carbon is basically constant at about 12 atomic percent. The level of nitrogen increases here from zero up to about 12 atomic percent. And again, we work with films that are right in this region here, six to eight atomic percent for the amount of nitrogen present. And of course, this, uh, the XPS, you know, the escape depth of the uh, photoelectron is rather shallow. So this information is coming from the top 10 nanometers or so of the film. Film thickness is about 400 nanometers. So uh, the XPS doesn't tell us about the uniformity with depth. The next data do show that. Oh, sorry, one more thing. Another technique that we use a lot is what's called electron energy loss spectroscopy. It's done in the TEM. And we can look, uh, the electrons have some energy impact in the sample. They have some energy coming out, and some of the energy is lost due to excitations in the material. And so we can study the energy loss in the carbon region. So this is the carbon 1s region here. And we can look at two, re two features in this energy loss spectrum. You can see there's an increase in the energy here 
at about 284 or 280, uh, 287.5 electron volts, and then we have another rise here at about 289. This particular transition is, a, is the 1s to sigma, pi, sigma star transition for the sp3 carbon. This particular transition right here is the 1s to pi star transition for the sp2 bonded carbon. And if you integrate these areas right here, here, and here, we can come up with what the relative ratio is of the sp3 to sp2 carbon. That's shown down here. So this is the sp3 atomic percentage going from no nitrogen to 50 SCCM nitrogen. You can see the sp2 content increases some as we add nitrogen to the film. And as the sp2 bonded carbon increases, the sp3 bonded carbon is decreasing some. So for this particular set of films, we had composition that's around 50-50 or 40-60 in terms of the sp2 and sp3 material. Again, the electrochemistry that I'll show you are for films with these two kinds of compositions. Now we just got some data just two days ago for a different set of films, and this is using XPS again, and you can use XPS to learn about sp3, sp2 carbon ratio in the material. So this is the carbon 1s spectrum here, going from about 280 to 290, uh, 295 electron volts. Here's the carbon 1s peak here. It's asymmetric, and if we fit this peak, there are two primary regions here, 284.5 is the sp2 carbon that's present, and 285.3 or so is the sp3 carbon. So this is a spectrum for a TAC film with no nitrogen. So you can see if we look at these data and analyze them, we have a film here that's about 55% sp3, 35% or so sp2 bonded carbon. Uh, we can look at the elasticity of the material to tell us something about its character, the, the Young's modulus as it's called. And so in this particular case, the Young's modulus is about 500 gigapascals, which is very characteristic of a, of a tetrahedral amorphous carbon film. Diamond is very stiff, right? And so it has a modulus that's about 1,000. So for these, these uh, diamond-like carbons, four, five, 600 gigapascals, these are very, very good values and very typical. So this value tells us it's a good tack film. If we look at the spectrum for one of our films that contains nitrogen, in this case, 30 SECM, different looking spectrum. Here again is the carbon 1S spectrum. And now we're going to fit those two peaks, the sp2 bonded carbon, the sp3 bonded carbon. And now you can see that the ratio is, is switched. So we have about 60% sp2 carbon in this material and about 25% or so sp3 in the material. So what we have to do at the present is we have a lot of electrochemical data and not so much characterization data for each of the films. So we're trying to co correlate this ratio with the electron transfer kinetics and so forth. But these films, as you can see, this one has a lot more sp2 carbon than we had originally anticipated. The Young's modulus drops, so about 300 gigapascals. This still is in the regime of a diamond-like carbon, but on the lower end. So this is much more like a uh, carbon nitride film, I think, than a tetrahedral amorphous carbon film, but it's still to be, to be de de determined. The nitrogen in the film is very interesting. So you can look at how this is the nitrogen 1S spectrum from the XPS. And you can deconvolute this spectrum right here to learn about the chemical environments of the nitrogen. So when we add the nitrogen, you wonder how the nitrogen is bonded in the material. So we can actually fit this spectrum right here to three peaks, two, 398, 399, and this one over here at 401. You can see the intensity is different. This particular peak uh, uh, is correlated with uh, pyridinic nitrogen that has oxygen bound to it. This particular component here is a pyrolic nitrogen environment. And over here we have a, a quaternary nitrogen environment. This isn't the structure of the tag, but it shows in the very small, the nitrogen in a four coordinated spot. So there's some ring structure around the nitrogen and it's sitting in a four coordinated spot. So this tells us that when we, these sp2 domains form, they originally form as linear chains, but if you get enough of them together, they start to form ring structures in the material. So we're getting some five-membered and some six-membered ring formation in some of these films, at least in this one example here. So XPS is very helpful to us to know something about the chemical environment of the nitrogen. Now, 
How does the nitrogen look with depth? This is a depth profile uh, looking at carbon 1s signal, the nitrogen 1s signal as we sputter into the material. So if you just look, here's the carbon signal. We get into the material about 450 nanometers, the thickness. The carbon signal goes down. The silicon signal from the substrate increases. And you can see the nitrogen signal is very uniform with depth. The XPS gave us information down here at the surface, but this depth profile tells us the nitrogen is distributed uniformly with depth in the material at about 8 atomic percent through there. Okay, now something about the electrochemistry of the material. So let, let's just look at some simple background curves because for us, these are always very, very revealing about the material properties. What I'm showing you here are several electrodes. This black one is glassy carbon. The red one is a boron dope diamond, all the same area. And the blue ones here are amorphous carbon films with different nitrogen levels. So you can see that the background signal for the TAC materials kind of fall in between the magnitude of the current for glassy carbon and the magnitude of the signal for diamond. So background current's not as low, but it's not nearly as high as what we have for, for glassy carbon. And remember, we're trying to answer the question, do these materials resemble diamond in terms of their electrochemical behavior or a graphitic electrode in terms of their behavior? This example says somewhere in between, at least in terms of the background signal. This measurement was made in one molar KCL. If you do another measurement here and look at the scan rate dependence here, which is important, that tells us that the, the background current in this potential region is capacitive in nature. So uh, plotting over here, background signals for the TAC, the black, a piece of glassy carbon, the red, and our diamond film here, the blue. You can see the background signal is, of the TAC is larger than the diamond, but not as large as the GC. And over here we can see that the, all of those currents for all three electrodes increase linearly with the, with the scan rate. They're all capacitive in nature. Slope difference is due to the capacitance value difference between each of the electrodes. Glassy carbon has a larger capacitance than TAC, and TAC has a larger capacitance than, than, the, than the diamond surface does. We look at things like the potential window to give us some indication of, of the quality of the material. If you just look at the top voltammogram up here, this again is in, uh, this is now a measurement in, uh, should be uh, sulfuric acid. You can see that our window here is roughly from about two volts to about minus one. So we have about a three, three volt potential window, which is very typical for, for diamond materials. One of the interesting things about this is that you can apply some anodic potentials. You can expose it to some very aggressive solutions and the microstructure is very stable. So if you do this kind of an experiment, this one or this one to a piece of glassy carbon, you get very big changes in the response. We see virtually no change. Actually, you can see here before and after, virtually no change in the response there. So again, this is some evidence that this TAC film is behaving more like a diamond electrode than uh, a, a glassy carbon electrode, for example. Okay. Let's look at some redox molecules and, uh, and do some investigation of how active the electrode is. I'll show you a couple of different redox systems here. This one is a uh, ruthenium hexamine. It's a plus three to plus two process, so one electron. No bonding changes around the ruthenium. So it's a very, very simple redox system. We, we, it's not very surface sensitive at all, the kinetics of it. So it's a very good one to use to know if your material is electrically conducting. So if we look for films with no nitrogen, 10 SECM, 30, and 50, we can look, the, the voltammograms are very well defined. The peak splitting is virtually unchanged. It's 62 millivolts here, almost Nernstian, so very fast. And over here, virtually unchanged is 62 millivolts. So adding nitrogen to the material changes the structure, but doesn't do anything to the kinetics for this particular redox system. So, welcome. So if you want to learn about the material properties, this one isn't really a very good system to use for that. It's not so sensitive to changes in the bonding chemistry of the carbon. We can look at another one. This is a iron three, iron two, iron three, the ferry ferrocyanide couple here. This one is quite a bit more sensitive to the condition of each electrode. Again, I'm showing you data for no nitrogen, 10 SCCM nitrogen, 30 and 50. So each of these films has more nitrogen added to the lattice. 
And you can see that the peak splitting actually for this system is somewhat sluggish, the kinetics to start with, increases a little bit, still sluggish, but increases some as we add nitrogen to the film. So this particular redox system is quite sensitive to the chemistry of the material, the electronic properties, as well as the microstructure. And you can do rate constant calculations, which we do. And so the rate constant on this material for this system is 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 2 centimeters per second. So about 10 times slower than what it is on glassy carbon. Ruthenium, on the other hand, tends to have rate constants about 0.05 to 0.1, which is basically the same value as you get for well-conditioned glassy carbon. 